The Venus Project. Team Speak Seminar. August 28, 2011. I guess some people have confusion about what a resource-based economy is, what the Venus Project is in relation to that. So Jack's going to speak to you about the holistic nature of a resource-based economy. A resource-based economy is all-inclusive. That means transportation, city design, education, the methods of education, and the new value system. If you don't include everything, if you leave out any of those factors, you'll have a problem. It includes agriculture, feeding people, distribution of goods and services. Any deviation from that system will cause problems. The system has been worked on for 75 years, and we've got it down pat. Now, if you want to change anything, you have to correspond with us or question any aspect of it. Okay, sorry, give me one sec. I'm just going to try and sort this out. Okay, you should be good to go now, Jack Moxon. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Go ahead. The resource-based okay. economy is all-inclusive. It means transportation, city design, production of goods and services, food production, and participatory. During the transition, it will be highly participatory. Different people in different professions will be able to serve the well-being of everyone else. It is not a technical elitism. It includes all aspects of social living. I didn't want you to think that it's just city design. It's a value system, the way we think, how we arrive at these conclusions. In other words, you will see every inch of the way as proposed by the Venus Project. If you deviate from those systems, it may not be a tried system or proven system. The Venus Project is based upon a lot of research and proven methods of social change. So we include, as I said before, all the systems that a resource-based economy will consider. It includes the raising of children, the school systems, the subject matter taught, the language used. We also will develop a newer language that has closer areas of agreement, which are not subject to interpretation. Whenever you read anything today or talk to somebody, remember that it's subject to interpretation. The Venus Project describes the process level of social operations. If you have any other questions regarding it, you should put them out now so yeah. that I can answer those questions. Do you want to go over what a resource-based economy is, a socio-economic system? A resource-based economy is a method of operating society in the most economical and efficient way to meet the needs of all the world's people. And there's nothing much more to say except what I've said. Now, if you don't understand it, it's up to you to question it. The people that come to our tours come here with a fixed set of values which they inherit from the system they live in. The Venus Project presents a new concept totally different than any known system. It includes the city design, transportation, education, growth of food, and what subject matter is taught. The subject matter has to do with how we relate to nature and one another. We are taught all systems of communication, the history of civilizations, and the limitations of the economic system that exists today. It's a very limited system, because in the economics of today, if you have a faster way of producing vacuum cleaners, if you share it with another company, you will lose the competitive edge. Therefore, Personal gain is emphasized in the present-day economy, which is against the well-being of most people. Therefore, there are no patents or secret processes. They are all shared by all members of society throughout the world. There are no patents. There are no secret processes. All the processes for production are made known. All of the transportation systems 
are based upon getting people to their source of work or participation with a minimum expenditure of energy. And this is basically what it's about. When you think about the monetary system, imagine thousands of automobiles parked for eight hours a day in front of production plants. Automobiles don't need rest. They don't need to be parked for eight hours. They can always be in use. The people leaving the factory will take the cars away. In other words, everything will be in motion. There'll be no freight trains in freight yards waiting for a period of excessive boom so that they'll be used. They're always used. When freight trains are used, they will be emptied and refilled and used on the way back to other storage systems and bring the goods and services to all areas required. They will not be stored in freight yards unless they're in service. But service will be done usually in the evening when things are not being moved as much. The Venus Project follows a procedural system. It is not a random system where anybody can do whatever they want to do. Just like bridge building, first thing you have to do is allocate materials for a bridge. Then you have to have the engineers who design bridges work on it, on the procedural system for constructing a bridge. The engineers do not tell people what to do or how to live. If they're bridge engineers, they merely build bridges. If they work in the agricultural area, that's all they do is they work in the agricultural area. They don't tell people what to do. People will be told on television what is needed, what is not known today. In other words, all of the research will be based on present day problems, such as cancer, heart disease, cystic fibrosis, and all the other diseases that plague civilization. The amount of hospitals that will be built will be based upon the amount of people that need hospitalization. That's what a resource-based economy means. A resource-based economy is a redesign of our economic and social system so it serves all people in all areas. When you say, well, does that include education? Yes, it does. Does it include means of transportation? Yes, it does. But it does not include deviation from the system. If you deviate from the system, you may run into jams and problems. If you want or require additional information on any aspect of the system, you will frame your question. And I'll try to answer it as best I can. It has nothing in common with any existing system. As I said before, if you have a faster way of producing things, it goes into the social design area and is made available to all production centers so that all production centers have the fastest way and the most economical way of consuming energy, recycling waste, so that there's no area that is not covered in the Venus Project. No area of social living. The houses of each individual will be designed to meet the needs and the interior required by each individual. Each individual will select the interior plan of their own building. The reason that we use domes is because they can bypass hurricane winds, the roof doesn't come off, the use of wood cuts down the forest, so we use composite materials in all our buildings so that they are fireproof, and when they're fireproof, you don't need fire engines, you don't need fire stations. They're designed to take so much on the Richter scale, say as much as seven on the Richter scale, the nine, so the buildings in the future may crack, but the reinforcement in the building, the mesh, the rebars, and the plasterous mesh will all be so arranged that the cement is embedded, not cement, but composite materials are embedded in it. So even if it cracks, it wouldn't cave in. The buildings are elevated above flood conditions in each region. So you don't have to deal with sandbags or anything else building. We will not build in earthquake zones, but if an earthquake does, the building will be most resistant 
to the forces of an earthquake. So all I can say is that after a comprehensive survey, before we build anything, we study the negative environment upon the object we're building. If we build a dam, we just release information as to all the benefits that dam will provide. And another group called the Negative Retroaction Group furnishes the information of the negative effects of a dam today. For example, fish can't get to the spawning grounds because there is no step system in the dam for fish to elevate themselves. In the Venus Project design, all dams and all power projects at different elevations make it possible for fish to climb that area and find the spawning grounds. So we also do that in the transportation of oil or fluids so that animals in migration can go by and pass it. It's up off the ground so it doesn't block the migration of animals. We will study hurricanes and the prime effectors that generate hurricanes. And then every research lab will be equipped to study methods of diminishing the power of hurricanes or eliminating the damage done by most hurricanes. That can be done by dropping iodide materials into hurricane, changing the temperature differential. By changing the temperature differential, you can change the storm effect and destructiveness of hurricanes. This also applies to earthquakes or any other form of social threat. When it comes to the Samis, let's say an underground or underwater quake, which raises the water into a hill, and that water is moved by the wind toward an island. What we do is we have one mile in advance of the island, out at sea, a wedge-shaped concrete form. And the wedge shape parts the destructive power of the wave coming toward the island. In other words, it's like the wake of a ship, or the front end of a ship sets up a wave motion which spreads out. And this is what we do a mile out from islands so they won't receive the complete pressure of a wave that will drown people. And also, as it occurs, as the volcanic or earthquake occurs under the sea, we notify people how far away it is from that island. And the best thing that they can do, they can retreat to an area that's elevated above the flood conditions. And there is no secret process, and there's nothing built without a careful survey, both the positive and negative effects of any construction system. There will be buildings put up that look like an inverted cone. Those buildings are designed to diminish the destruction of winds, hurricanes, tornadoes, and all the prime effectors that hurt people. We will design our buildings and safety centers based upon the minimal destruction. And this is what you have to do. You have to include all those things. But there's also a group called the Operation or Special Contingencies Group. They have access to all surplus materials. In other words, we use the polar regions to store surplus food grown by all the nations and surplus building materials. We use the polar region to store surplus food. We dehydrate the food so it won't take up as much area. The Special Contingencies Department have immediate access to food. If there's an earthquake or destruction in any part of the world, they have immediate access to the food in the polar regions, the North and South Pole. They don't have to go to government agencies to get permission to use that. They have the permission to act immediately and get that food out or get emergency equipment out to any area. All hospitals are equipped with emergency systems, not one, but more than one, maybe three, on separate circuits. As I said before, all hospitals will be equipped with more than one emergency lighting system so that you don't depend on one system. Everything in the society will apparently be redundant, meaning that you don't count on any 
one socially integrated computer. If that fails, another takes over. All the computers are automatically updated with plug-in systems so that they can be operated immediately. In the event of failure, they automatically repair themselves. But that is eventually. Our only problems will exist during the transition from a monetary system to a resource-based economy. If you have any questions about the system, don't hesitate to ask. There's no such thing as a dumb question. Here's a question. Where are the industrial areas? The industrial areas are outside the outer perimeter of the city. And they're very different in design than present day systems. There's a circular middle in which the engineering and planning group work on the production methods. All of the production lines or conveyor belt are extended outward from the center. So you have production of refrigerators, air conditioners, and similar objects. Each plant encircles the city itself, and people live between the planning areas and the production areas. There's a question, what about things like football stadiums? Yes, well, I would say that in the new education system, new games will be arranged to enhance the physiology of the players. A new value system will be installed, not to beat the other guy, and not to feel proud of beating another team. There'll be no competition, only cooperation on how to hit the basket, how to get the ball into the basket, but it'll be improving human skills. You will play tennis against an image, a virtual image of yourself. You will improve your chemistry, you'll improve your research process, you'll improve your physical abilities, but you will not try to beat the other fellow. This is the old game system of the monetary system, which is self-centered. We will have no self-centered competition in the future. How do you eliminate social stratification? Because there is no stratification to start with. Bridge builders build bridges. Architects design cities. They don't tell you what to do. Behavioral scientists arrange the methods of improving human relations to one another and how to solve your own problems. You don't have to go to counselors. In schools, you'll be taught how to deal with problems. In terms of social stratifications, nobody's rewarded for things that they've done more so than other people. I wouldn't say it exactly that way. People are rewarded by putting an end to poverty, human suffering, and dangerous jobs. That's your reward. No wars, no prisons, no armies, no navies, no killing. I was referring to no, nothing like no Nobel Prizes. People aren't singled out for things like that because they understand it's cooperative. In other words, If you do research on heart disease or cancer and you find out 110 things that don't work, that's just as important as finding answers. So there are no rewards, just the opportunity to engage in solving human problems is enough of a reward for a sane society. So in terms of social stratification, there isn't any one group that would either get rewards or better resources. They get the resources that they need within the field of their study or their interest. So everybody has free access or equal access to whatever their interests are, whatever they need. Okay, what are the constraints you set up for your city designs? What are the considerations for your city designs? Energy determinants, the type, the amount of energy it takes to operate a city, the convenience and safety for the public, and the fact that the people or the occupants of the new city find it desirable and operational, and find that the transportation is adequate to their needs. That is the main criteria, that it serves the well-being of all the inhabitants of the city, not a selective group. Without grades, how do you determine the most knowledgeable from a certain field? How well the system works is the only method you can use. How well does the system work? If it doesn't work well, We try to innovate and study newer systems. 
and select that on the basis again of how well the system works. That's your criteria. In terms of the people who will be working in different fields, how performance do you pick them? contract only. Performance only. What kind of materials are there going to supposed to be used? The best materials? The the ones that um, must be or if you have any blueprints regarding uh, concrete using on buildings, etc. Yes, we do. But if we release them now, they can be commercially taken and used and patented and prevent us from using it. But I can only tell you this, that the materials used will be composite materials and they will have air bubbles in the middle of the wall, lots of air bubbles in the material to serve as insulation and non-condensation areas and they will also prevent noise from traveling into the building from the outside. The outer walls will be a sandwich, it will be a sandwich type material with high density outer surface and the rooftops will be a tile like material which is resistant to the weather and corrosion resistant. And also an energy generator as well. Yes, photoelectric cells will be built into the tiles themselves. You do not hang photoelectric cells on the roof. The roof itself is a generating material. Also contains pressure transducers for expansion and contraction of the new materials so that you can get energy from many different aspects of the structure itself. <laughs> Okay, what will happen to already existing metropolis cities, towers, or buildings? Most of the cities extract tremendous amounts of energy and are very inefficient. They require rebuilding of tunnels, rebuilding of equipment transmission on the ground. They are so inefficient, every building is a different size, uses different size windows. If you continue that process, you won't have enough resources to take care of the people's needs. If you standardize equipment, that is update equipment to the latest methods, then you can have a more efficient economy. For example, in our round cities, we only design one eighth of the system in some designs and repeat the process continuously until we get a circle. But today you have architects designing every building. We will level the old cities and mine them for metals, glass, or whatever materials we can use. The old cities will keep some aspects of the old cities to show future generations what cities used to be like, but we will not live in them. We will preserve the pyramids by building a protective zone over the buildings so that future generations can enjoy seeing some of the old world constructions. We will preserve whatever needs to be preserved to help serve in the education of children of the future. I have a question for Jack uh, regarding population control. I know that he's mentioned that education will play a key part in that. Could Jack please elaborate on how we will control levels of population into the future? You don't control people. When children go to school, they learn the laws of dynamic equilibrium, meaning certain amount of area can support a certain amount of people. If you overload that zone with more people than the water has in the arable land area, you're going to have territorial problems. Problems result due to technical negligence. They are not human nature. It's not that people are greed or mean. They respond to the environment just like all other objects respond to natural law. Man is subject to natural law in the same way that all other materials are subject to natural law. Only he can modify the environment to diminish the negative effects of natural law. This is the difference, the major difference. I have a question, if that's okay. Yes. Certainly, sir. Okay, it's from one of the guys in Spain. He'd like to know that, well, he understands that we're working towards a society where we hardly have to work at all. But he'd like to know how the work will be allotted when there is less work to do. How will that little bit of work be shared out? Who will get to work and who won't work? 
by technical competence. Do you understand what that means? By the ability of a person to perform the job very well. Okay, thank you, I understood that. They are selected on the basis of competence and performance. And the people who propose a project, for example, if somebody says, I think we need a bridge here, can they also work on the project? Yes, if they are competent, if they are bridge engineers, structural engineers, materials developer, metallurgists, yes, if they have the ability to do so, they certainly will. And there'd always be education free to enable them to get that knowledge if they don't have it, if they'd like to participate. Okay, thanks. In the emergency field, we don't select people to participate. All that's done long in advance of any emergency. So all the people are designated, lined up to handle any job. You don't need to go to a search in any emergency. It's done prior to the emergency. And that would be to enable food to be brought in. That would be to put up houses again and infrastructure, not just bring in food and tents and hope the economy will take care of it. There'd be plans and preparations long in advance before there is a catastrophe. Jock, how do you foresee the modern university system changing over time into the resource-based economy? They'll be included in the new cities. Universities are separate structures, not necessary. They'll be included, and the universities will not only provide good services, demonstrations, and all of the equipment necessary to enhance the learning process. To enhance education, they will be given all the photographic methods, all the educational devices, all the films necessary to help emphasize how systems work. In other words, universities today depend on appropriations and money. And if you don't have the money, you have limited equipment. We don't have that. And where we have less equipment than necessary, we have a library system. The library system makes all things available. The public library makes books available to people. Make sure to the public library there's a camera center where anyone can check out a camera. Next door to that, we have whatever equipment, musical instruments, whatever is necessary, you can check out musical instruments just like the public library. We arrange all materials just like the public library. Where there are shortages, you can get it from the library system. And also, of course, the educational system will deal with problems that are relevant to the resource-based economy and the problems that people have solving them for better housing, better transportation, medical care, right, growing food without depleting the soil, better energy systems, handling pests, in other words, mosquitoes will be handled without poison sprays by acoustical methods using sound, keeping certain types of insects away from plants. But I want you to understand there are some insects that are good for plants. They will not affect those insects. We have to do a lot of research to upgrade the system. And the Venus Project is nothing but continuously upgrading a system. Uh, what are the benefits for the country that starts building the, the test city, the first city? No particular benefits except that be the first city or nation to build a first example of a resource-based economy, the first circular city, which is the planning center for the next city. The first circular city will be open to all nations to come and visit and look at it and see if they like it and want to join with us. It is also used to test the validity of the Venus Project proposals to see if it works as well as the Venus Project claims it will. In other words, and if it doesn't, we can modify it. Until we get it operating real well, then we will invite all people from all over the world as guests to come and study the system and see if they'd like to build it in their country. We don't force anybody, we don't use military systems, we don't assassinate people, 
we give them the opportunity to test the new system and see if they'd like to install it in their country. The choice is purely up to that nation. And if a nation refuses to join the world community, we feel that in time they will. Don't press it. Don't twist their wrist. Don't torture people. Don't use military means. Give them a chance to look at our system. Give them a chance to study it and compare it to their own system. Although some nations may take longer than others to join with us in a global society. We do not force our values upon people. Will you continue building other cities if there is no global consensus about the resource-based economy? Can it work? No, we will not. The country has to decide that they'd like to try an experimental city, then we'll build it for them. And if they like it, they will build them all over, all over that area and join with other nations and do away with all the artificial boundaries that separate people. So people could travel anywhere in the world without a passport. The next question that follows is that, what do you do if everybody wants to live in Florida? Well, everybody doesn't want to live in Florida. People like change. People like snow. Some people like skiing. They all don't want to live in one area. All that is a myth. Roxanne, we spoke earlier about the problem with identity within this system, within our current capitalist system, and how that plays in relationships with the Venus Project. I was wondering if you could just sort of give a 10, 15 minute chat on that and how you see that playing within the Venus Project. Also, you've had dealings with certain people in certain organizations, nonprofits, and stuff that have heavy identities within this system, whether that be, you know, sort of UN stuff or, or, or other think tanks and things like that. Yes, I was talking to Andrew earlier today about our past experience with dealing from the top down to certain organizations. And a lot of times when we spoke with people, they had a very high identity with what they were doing. They were already entrenched in it. They were reinforced by people following them. And they had a certain position they were upholding. And they liked that position. So a lot of times it was harder to introduce new ideas regarding this. Did you want to say something, John? Yes. If people have better ways of doing things, they submit it to the socially integrated computer. And if the methods are better, if they haven't been invented in 1926, they will be installed. So everyone can participate. I know we were talking about something else, and I know you couldn't hear Andrew here, but we are talking about our past experiences dealing with... The Venus Project doesn't concern itself with past experience. This was in relation to a question that we were just having some involvement with an organization recently this past week who were really not that interested in the Venus Project, but they, we were talking, I was talking to the head of the organization, and he wasn't interested in new ideas and new things. He just wanted certain aspects of what the Venus Project had to offer, like the designs. He was impressed with the designs, because this is the first organization he had ever seen that had designs for the future in this way. So they wanted to use our designs in relation to what they were advocating which was rule of law, participatory democracy, parliaments, and things like that. And we couldn't let them use it in conjunction to something else, some old values, which they were calling a new paradigm. And I was just talking to Andrew and mentioning that sometimes people really don't have an idea of this direction, and they're entrenched and have positions of high authority within their organization. And it's harder to get to people like that sometimes. Did you want to discuss something yes. else? I want to say that apparently a lot of people don't seem to understand what technical competence means. Anybody in the society that has the ability to improve things will be heard and their methods will be tested so that it is not a technical elitism or any other kind of elitism. Andrew, did you want to talk about something in relation to the website and certain things that we were working on? Yeah, sure, can do. Basically, as many of you know, I've been working on developing 
the New Venus Project website, as well as the New Venus Expressions website and the TVP Activism website, which we're hoping to have ready for public launch within the next couple of weeks. We're going to be doing a short beta test on the sites probably the next weekend, and then the following week we're planning on opening it up to the public. These new websites, the Venus Expressions Media website and the TVP Activism website, they won't have a registration area on them. The idea is that you register on the New Venus Project website. That automatically signs you up for the subscription to the newsletter. And you can also use those login details for the other two websites. The plan is any future websites that we choose to do, that same login will be able to use for all of the TVP related sites. Um, so it makes it easier for everyone. Next, my plan really after that is to put some time into the further development of the TVP core teams and also the TVP activism teams to start, start getting some, some small projects underway within the TVP activism teams globally. And start developing up some ideas for larger projects, for example, six monthly or yearly regional events, etc., to be held on the Venus Project, whether they be festivals or whatever we need to discuss all of this. And then the intent is once we start to get that going a little bit, I'm going to start working on the TVP design teams, in particular the game design, which we've started developing the basic structure of the game so far on paper. That's a project where we'd like to get started. The city design team is probably the biggest one, and that's going to be last for that reason. And that's where all the, the my real efforts is going to be put into over the next few years once I get the visualisation teams up and running, etc., for the, the 3D stuff. So that's pretty much where we are as far as the team developments, etc., are concerned at the moment. The TVP core teams are coming along nicely. Those involved with developing those teams are doing a good job. One thing I would like to say to everyone is just remember that when you join a team, regardless of what team it is, you're not limited to that team. You can actually join you know, almost any team. Obviously, the TVP design teams are specifically for people with scientific or technical professions relevant to those projects but other than that I think most of the teams are pretty much open to everyone so feel free to jump in and help out on any of them if you feel that that's an area that you'd like to work in. Thanks Andrew. Anybody else have any questions at this time? Jock, was there ever one moment in particular in your younger years where it was almost like a light bulb went off and it was an aha moment? that gave you, I guess, the basis for uh, your life's work of promoting the Venus Project in a resource-based economy? Was there ever that one moment that completely changed it for you? The Great Depression in the United States, 1929 crash, when 15 million people were out of work, sleeping in every empty lot, trying to figure out what happened and how to survive. That was the conditions that generated my curiosity in, and questioning the validity of the economic system we lived under. It was World War II that pulled us out of the 1929 crash. Was there something that initiated the direction of the resource-based economy in particular? Well, my grandfather telling me that people came from all over the world and brought ideas to America. They brought the printing press from Germany and language from England and Louis Pasteur, Frenchman. And my grandfather said, we owe so much to so many different countries. If you pledge allegiance to any one country, you negate the contributions made by others. So I refused to pledge allegiance to the flag. I decided to pledge allegiance to the earth and everyone on it. I like that idea much better than separate nations. Does that help answer that for you? Yes, definitely, actually. It reminds me that um, when I was young, my friend uh, Jack and I in fifth grade uh, had a somewhat similar sentiment when we were young, when we realized that the pledge was kind of foolish. But it's, that's awesome that... I, I don't know, just, the, whole, the whole story is just awesome to hear, and I'd like to talk to Jock more about that another time.
I think what's uh, also very interesting, and I, I'm myself using it a lot when I talk to other people about the Venus project, are the experiences of Jacques on the islands. And maybe he can talk about that a little. Do you want to talk about the islands, your experience there? Yes, I wanted to know how people get to be the way they are if they weren't educated. So I worked my way on a boat to some remote islands in the South Pacific to see what people would be like. When I arrived, none of them wore clothing. They were swimming nude ever since they were children, and there were no peeping toms. Do you understand that? There were no fetishes. When you cover the portions of a female body, if you cover a female's nose, and said to a male, did you ever see a female's nose? He said, no, show him half a nose, and he's going to have to loosen his collar. If he's brought up to that value system, our sexual behavior is shaped by the culture we live in. Our peeping tongs, our fetishes are all shaped by culture. They are not natural. When women say in America, you know how men are, all they think of is sex. That's because it's covered, because if boys and girls swam nude when they were very young, there would be no peeping toms, there would be no girly magazines, there'd be no burlesque shows. All of these things are byproducts of an aberrant culture. Can I just ask Jacques uh, about something uh, regarding this topic? In, he, in uh, the book Looking Forward, he mentions, uh, or there's actually a mentioning of uh, uh, an example where um, he kind of like um, uh, unofficially requested a boat and they built one for him and then they took it away because he didn't use it. Is there any uh, other such examples? Because that was very useful for me to actually give, a, give it to people in a sense. On one of the islands, a group of islands of Tuamotu, I asked the natives if they would help me build an outrigger canoe. I just want you to know that I can build an outrigger canoe far neater and slimmer and better than most of the natives, but I wanted to participate with them. They didn't answer me. They got in a huddle and they talked to one another and then they went away. About a week later, they brought an outrigger uh -huh. canoe and placed it in front of my fast hut. And they said, indicated anyway and then and they had a slight dialect and they said this is for you they indicated that the canoe was built for me and i said thank you is there anything i can do for you and they didn't understand what that meant they really did they tried to but they couldn't understand they said they made the canoe because i needed it anyway about a week later i heard some rustling outside of my hut and I looked out, and they were sneaking off with the canoe that they gave me. So I stepped out, and I said, what's going on? And they said, semi-angrily, you no use, we take back. Do you understand that? That was their value system. How about the fish? And, the and then the next three days later, older people were pulling in a net full of fish. And they threw fish to anyone standing there. They didn't say, you owe me five bucks or you owe me ten bucks. They just threw fish to anyone. They shared their catch. Do you understand that? Yeah, that's great. Uh, these are these great examples. Um, I really like the one about the canoe because of the you don't use it, therefore you might not need it. Can you um, elaborate a little bit on that? Well, I figured I'd use it when I got around to it, but I never got around to it. I was too busy doing other things, and so they took it back. It's like you taking a book out of the library and keeping it for a month and not reading it. Do you understand that? That's the same type of thinking. In other words, the type of thinking we have today are not problem solvers. We depend on other people. We have to go to see a conflict resolution group if we have things we don't understand. The schools of tomorrow will equip children with a value system so that they can work out problems themselves. They don't have to go to psychologists or psychiatrists. The reason I have so much against psychiatrists and psychologists because they try to adjust people to this system, which is aberrated. 
if they were sane, they would not adjust them to the system. The educational system emphasizes criticism and re-examination of every idea they've ever heard of. It encourages people to, using old language, think for yourself. We heavily endorse what you call individuality, but not individuality that's destructive, that hurts other people. When people think of people being the same today, I think of people being robotic today. The ideas today are very similar and they don't question things. In the future, it would be very different. They would learn how to explore and do critical thinking and check everything out with the scientific method. They don't have that degree of inquiry today or don't even know how to do it. They don't know what the scientific method is. Another interesting story about the islands that Jack had do you want to go over in terms of well, the chief of the island had many wives and he liked Jacques so he offered Jacques his best wife he said would you like my best wife she may please you yeah I said that I was brought up in a different culture with a different set of values I deeply appreciate that but I cannot accept it I cannot indulge in that because my values are very different he wasn't wrong or right. He was just expressing the values of the island, of the chief of the island. As new discoveries, findings, or ideas in education are developed, how are they chosen for implementation? Are there test groups set up? I answered that before, but I'll say, how well does a new system work? That's the only criteria. Does it work well? Does it meet the needs? If it does, it'll be used. If it doesn't, it won't. There'd always be new things tried, though, to see how they, well they work. It's not one thing or the other. They try different things, and if it works, and it's implemented. It's a big experimental process. Uh, yeah, I would like to add something, something about, about education. Even in, the, in today's means of technology, I think we have already some hints of what the future could be in terms of education. If you think of things like augmented reality, when you have, for example, in today's technology, uh, like an iPad or something like this, and you travel around, you can take this thing with you all the time. And um, if you're at some place that's interesting, for example, if you're standing in front of a bridge and you want to know something about it, you point the device towards the bridge and maybe make a picture of it and you get instant information of it. You can maybe look at a technical drawing. You can, uh, perhaps there's a problem with the bridge, so you can uh, um, you, you can read about the problem. You can put, maybe join the team that designs the bridge and all things like this. And education will be, like Jack said, implemented into the city. I think this is one aspect that maybe people that are used to, to today's technology can understand more. and. Uh, maybe it's a good example of how the future could be in, in terms of education. I'd just like to add that online schooling is also uh, only getting better by the year to the point where you can get a relevant education online as good as you can in a classroom. And I didn't believe it until I started supplanting uh, my schooling with online school. But yeah, that's just a caveat. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. I recently, I re I recently joined Khan Academy. Sorry. Most of my schooling was not very useful. I, uh, I, I quite enjoyed it when the internet came about because then I could finally learn again. Uh, has anyone else got any more questions for Jacques and Roxanne? If not, we're going to tie it up now. Recently, I was talking about the Venus Project to some people, and somebody asked me the following question. Would the Venus Project require more computer programmers and technical people in order to keep it maintained? First of all, you have to ask certain questions. What is the society for? What do you hope to accomplish? Where do you want to go? And if the majority of people agree with the direction of the Venus Project, then you set out to accomplish that. In other words, in the military systems, they decide how many planes they would need and what kind of performance those planes should have in relation to what they call the enemy. So 
you have to survey the conditions. What is it that you want to accomplish? What are the purpose of cities? What's the purpose of education? And if the purpose of education is to make people variable rather than uniform, to do away with uniformity, to make more creative people, more Da Vinci's, more Michelangelo's. In other words, what the children of the future will not understand is why there was only one Edison, one Louis Pasteur, one Tesla. There should have been thousands of them. And that's what the Venus Project will create. Thousands of Teslas, thousands of Michelangelo's, thousands of Louis Pasteur's. All the citizens will be raised to be creative. There will be whatever is necessary to accomplish a given end. How would be the health system in a resource-based economy? I mean, how would the hospitals work and all that stuff? How would the hospitals work? What would the process be like if people go to the hospitals? If they're wearing earrings, if they're women or men wearing earrings, there'll be a chip in the earring. That means if you're in an accident of any kind and you're wheeled into the hospital, that chip will bring your medical records out. They don't need to ask you a lot of questions. The hospitals will consist of engineers, electronic men, medical people. Problems in medicine are not only anatomical and physiological, they're also electrical, chemical, and it takes many people to work on cancer and heart disease, not just doctors. They will work with many different disciplines, including physicists. The hospitals will be designed as circular systems for reasons of economy, energy consumption, and convenience. There will be a great deal of automatic equipment to assist the doctors so that they're not overloaded. Today, many hospitals are equipped with electronic devices that measure the heart rate and many other physiological problems. You are monitored by electronic equipment. In the future, more equipment will be available so doctors can pay more attention to the surgery or whatever it is they're doing. Eventually, I see surgery being replaced by replacing humans surgery can become automated and I see doctors gradually being phased out and most technicians will be phased out in the distant future. Machines will design bridges, houses, buildings and specify the metallurgical combinations of metals for strength of materials. I believe all that can be integrated into computerized systems, eventually. This is not immediately. This is after the transition. Do you see doctors being on call at all sorts of hours in the night? When necessary, yes. I think that one thing that also adds to this aspect of medicine and uh, healthcare is that all people in the future will be educated very much more than today and everybody will be aware of most functionalities of his or her body, and people won't even start to smoke, I think, and all sorts of things that will benefit the healthcare system in a holistic manner. And so, um, yeah, there will, will be more, more education overall, I think, and that this will benefit the, the whole system again. Yes, that would be true. It would be a more holistic approach of how you live healthfully. <laughs> Hi Jack, I have a question for you. Are you really happy with the growth, uh, present growth of uh, Venus Project? And is it matching with the blueprints you made decades back when you planned this all concept? So, and do you have any plan how we reach to implement all these things, what we are talking about? Are you happy with the growth of the Venus Project presently? Does it match your blueprints you made years ago? Well, the blueprints are constantly updated. They're not fixed. I have no ideal city or utopia. Everything will undergo change. There are no final frontiers. Your laptop will get smaller, lighter, faster, 
and store more information. And there are no final laptops. Are you happy with where the growth of the Venus Project at present? I don't know what that means, but we constantly update everything to the best of our ability. I guess to where it is now within society, the recognition of it within society, the progress that it's made. Well, no, we can always do better. We always work on better ways of presenting ideas. But, you know, just knowing Jack personally, he doesn't get happy or, or disappointed like that. He works towards it and does his best to present it because he's had certain findings that he feels are relevant to people, the way they behave and how we could live our lives and organize society. But he doesn't have expectations and doesn't get disappointed you know, he understands that this is where we are. It's a certain phase in, in evo social evolution. We have no money. We have no control of the media. So we can only do what we can do, and we constantly work at it. Would you say that's accurate? Yes. That is very accurate. So certainly, uh, then we, we need more managers along with the scientists. Uh, am I right? He said, so we need more managers along with the scientists. Is that right? I don't know what managers are. Well, in other words, the management of the Earth resources. Is there to, somebody... to manage Earth resources, you have to be scientific. A geologist, entomologist, you have to be a sociologist. It takes all technical competence to manage society. It cannot be managed by businessmen. I would say at this time, we need more people knowledgeable about this direction and working towards it any way that they can in all medias. We live in a world where ideas are being sold for power and money. How do we know it's not the same with the Venus Project? Because there is no money in the Venus Project. There are access centers where you can access whatever you want just like the public library. There's a thing called nonviolent communication, which it seems like a lot of RBE advocates are starting to like. I was wondering if Jack has ever looked into the materials of Marshall Rosenberg, viewed any of his lectures, or read any of his materials. Marshall Rosenberg for nonviolent communication. No. Roxanne, can you do the old usual uh, address of the, you know, the same old issue that comes up now and again of why do you expect people to donate or why do you, you know, want people to, to pay their way towards helping get this thing going and why you charge for your products, etc., etc. Andrew is asking why we're asking for donations, why we're charging for our products. Because we can't produce the stuff. We live in a monetary system, and publishers tell us that if we want so many thousand magazines or books published, they charge us $40,000. We have to pay for that. We have to pay for taxes on our buildings. We are not sponsored by the government or anybody else. And for 25 years or 30 years, years, we've been paying our own way all the way through. And I don't think that that is what you would call fair in a system that people want to be cooperative. Cooperative means everybody should help support the Venus Project, that believe in it. Don't put it on Roxanne and Jock. It's not fair. I can only say for the last 35 years, actually before Zygite's addendum, we never got any donations. We put all our funding into this research center, which we do live at, but it's... Funding. Yeah, our own funding through outside jobs. We do live here, but all the buildings are for working and producing books and videos and things. We have no publisher for our book. We produce our book ourselves. We publish our book ourselves, which means we pay for it. We've paid over $100,000 already just to get the books published. So we sell them in order to do more books and in order to have them printed as well. So. We have to sell our books within this system. We have to pay our taxes. We don't have the jobs we had before, and we are 
I always looked at somebody buying the book as their small contribution, money contribution to this direction because we have been carrying it ourselves. Thank you to the Jack Thanks a lot, Andrew. We really appreciate every, appreciate everybody coming here to listen as well. Keep your questions coming in. That'd be great. Thanks again, everyone. So uh, hopefully we'll talk to everybody next week.